Okay, so now I think I got going. So what I want to talk to, this is actually two black holes merging, but let's pretend they're neutron stars, is you see that they're orbiting around each other. Um, and they're going to get closer and closer over time. This is because it's gravitational pull. And as they do, they actually get slightly deformed before they even touch each other. And then at some point, they actually collide. And you see that's the remnant there, which might be a black hole, might be a hypermassive neutron star. And after that happens, you see then these gravitational waves that propagate in time. And then eventually, they're going to hit the Earth. And you can see that as the gravitational waves hit the Earth, it then also deforms the Earth. And so these tiny little deformations as the Earth is, is here and going through the gravitational waves are things that we can detect on Earth. And you can see here, this is an example of LIGO, where this is actually detected here using lasers. So the thing that I really like about neutron stars, and specifically about neutron star mergers, is they combine all the different aspects of the standard model. And so you can see here we have electromagnetism. If we have a neutron star merger, there's a very good chance you can have a kilonova where you can have an actual visual signal of what happened. Doesn't happen in all the cases, there's some complications, but there is a good chance you could have this. You also have the strong force, which is by far my favorite force. This is the force that binds together the nucleus, it binds together protons and neutrons, these building blocks of matter. You have the weak force. This is also plays a very crucial role in neutron stars because you have neutrinos. And because of these weak interactions, you get a lot of cool physics that occurs in neutron stars. And of course, last but very much not least, is you have gravity. That's really holding the shape of the neutron star together. And that's really what happens is the gravitational pull is what's binding them together, making them merge. So you have all the four fundamental forces joined together inside a neutron star merge. So then you can think about, well, what is it that we can actually observe? We know we get these gravitational waves on Earth, they hit LIGO or Virgo. What is it that we can actually understand about physics from these gravitational waves? So you can see here what the signal would look like. At the very early times, if you remember the video that I showed you, is that you have these two stars that are orbiting around each other. Now, before they even touch each other, they start to become de deformed. They squish. And so you can think this squishiness depends on what's inside the star. If it's a big fluffy star, it can squish much more. But if it's a very, very compact object, try squishing a bowling ball, and that would not work very well, right? So it depends on what the density of the star is, how much you can actually deform it. So this early stage, you can measure the tidal deformability, which is what it's called. It's very, very cool because the two stars are far apart from each other. So relatively, the energy and the masses and everything inside it, it's cool. We just, it's not technically cool, it's actually 10 to the 6 Kelvin, but for nuclear physics, that is your temperature for me. And then you think about, okay, this part is something we can measure. This is something in terms of uh, what we can extract from the data, we have this information today. And we'll have many more data points in the years to come. Then at some point, these neutron stars eventually actually touch each other, they hit. And this is the merger itself. This can become extremely hot. So on the order of 10 to 12 Kelvin. So you see, this is when I say it's hot, it's many of order magnitude higher than what I say is cool. And in terms of MEV, which are the units I tend to like, so it could be up to 100 MEV if you're optimistic. Now, eventually, after they merge, you have some sort of final state. This is what we call the remnant. And we don't actually know what this is yet. There's a lot of questions in terms of how this initial state and the properties of these neutron stars lead to the final state. And there's many, many groups actively investigating this today. But the idea is this observation, if it turns into a black hole, if it turns into a rapidly rotating neutron star or a hypermassive neutron star or something else, can actually give us a lot of information about the inner workings of a neutron star. It was in the very core. So at this point in time, the only data that we have for sure is from the spiral. We think from GW 170817, the one that we have measured, we have some idea of what the remnant is. We think it's a black hole, but there are a lot more questions than answers at this point. So what I want to do, though, the questions that keep me up at night 
or what is inside a neutron star. And when I say inside, I don't mean here at the edges, but what's in the very core of a neutron star? This is a question that really puzzles physicists and is very, very hard to answer because you reach densities that are way beyond anything that you can reach on Earth. So to give you a kind of an idea of what we think and what makes up the different layers of a neutron star, just like we think of our own Earth, there's many different layers to our Earth, and there's a lot of very complicated physics as you go towards the center of the Earth. It's the same thing for a neutron star. If you go to the outer crust, we generally think this is composed of nuclei. So you could think of as far as you're out you go at the very edge is very light nuclei. And then as you go deeper and deeper into the star, the nuclei become heavier and heavier and heavier. That's because they're squeezed more and more. On top of that, they're not heavier, but they have less of the charge. They have more and more neutrons in the nucleus as you go deeper. Eventually what happens is you cannot put any more neutrons in the nucleus. They just keep leaking out. It, it just cannot contain any more neutrons. And this is called the neutron drip line. If you reach a point where you can no longer have more uh, nucleons in the nucleus, and so you have these nucleons floating around as well. Now, eventually you squeeze matter so much that you get to these really wild stages, which are called FOSTA stages. That means that you can make strings of neutrons and protons that look like lasagna or spaghetti or gnocchi or something like this. So you can get a lot of fun shapes that will come out of here. Now, the issue is that you can continue to go even deeper. And when you go deeper and deeper, you can no longer sustain these stages, these FOSTA stages as well, and you have just liquid nuclear matter. And so you think about what happens for two-body interactions, three-body, four-body interactions, and that's really what the, what the underlying physics is. And the part that I like, and what I'm really, really interested in, is this part here, is if we can get to the point of having deconfined QCD matter. And now, there's a lot of question marks, and we don't even really know what that means. Does that mean, you know, quarks and gluons? How many flavors? Are they going to be paired somehow? Uh, are they going to be super close, super conducting states? I, I really don't have a good answer for you. But this reaches densities way beyond that we can reach on Earth, and that's why we have so many questions there. So what we're trying to probe here, just to give you an idea of the scales, is we want to see what is inside basically a proton, which is on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters, and if there's quarks and gluons, their interaction, you can think of more on the order of 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 19 meters, so very, very tiny scales. We want to see if these properties of these little particles that are inside the proton at these very tiny scales can actually give us information about something that is extremely far away from Earth. To give you an idea, is I'm going to be talking about this specific um, uh, gravitational wave signal, GW190814. It was around 10 to the 22 meters away from Earth. So not that difference in order of magnitude in terms of smallness and distance away from Earth. And I'm trying to understand if you compare those two. So to get into this a little more, we'll talk about quarks and gluons. We know from the standard model that we have six different quarks. Generally, we talk about the light quarks, up and down and strange. And these are the ones we think might exist in the very core of the neutron star. If you go to heavier ones, it would be very hard to have something stable or long-lived enough within a neutron star. So most likely it will be up, down, and strange. What mediates their interactions are these gluons here. But we don't quite know how those interactions would look at really, really large densities. So in terms of knowing the properties of the strong quarks, that's how these quarks and gluons interact with each other. They have very specific properties that give us information and then help us to build up more information about neutron stars. So the two underlying properties of the strong force, otherwise known as quantum chromodynamics, or you'll hear me say QCD quite a bit in this talk, are the following. Is one, you have bound states. So that means that you don't have free quarks and gluons just floating around in nature. There's always confinement. And so they can combine together into three quarks, for instance, and this would create a baryon. And you can have different types of areas. You can have a proton or a neutron, which is what makes up the vast majority of nuclei 
in the universe, but you could also get something more exotic, like a lambda, which has one strange quark in there, and you can create a nucleus that has a lambda in there, which is known as a hypernucleus. So you can get some pretty interesting combinations here. Of course, then you also have antimatter as well. If you had three quarks that are all antiquarks, you would then have an antiproton. Now, neutron stars, they're so, so, so dense that we generally ignore antiparticles completely. You can also get mesons, and this would be like a pion or a kaon. These are generally some quark antiquark pair. The other major property that you have from QCD is that imagine I had a meson here. In this case, I'm looking at like a row meson, and I want to just pull apart the quarks in the meson. If I had very, very tiny tweezers and I tried to pull them apart, what would happen? Um, I don't know if you all know these, but these like little finger traps that you might have played with when the kids, if you put your finger in it and you try and pull it apart, it becomes tighter and tighter. That's a lot like what would happen with a meson if you try to pull it apart, is that it just becomes tighter and tighter. And instead of actually getting the quark anti quark pair apart from each other, it would be easier to create a quark anti quark pair from the vacuum. And you would basically be seeing a rogue meson decaying into two pions. So it's easier to create anti quark, quark anti quark pairs than actually separating quarks. So looking for something like deconfined matter, where they're not bound together in hadrons is a really major puzzle and a question that's driving a number of nuclear physicists today. And just to kind of tell you how the gluons fit in there, is the gluons are really the thing sticking these quarks together. And so one time my daughter asked me, what is the stickiest glue on Earth? And the answer really is the gluons. So the question is, I know, um, you know, I can write down the theory for you right now. What's the Lagrangian of quantum chromodynamics? Here it is. That's not a mystery. We've known this for many, many years. The issue is, though, I can only solve this Lagrangian in very, very specific regimes. In fact, the way, the only regime where I can actually solve this Lagrangian is when my number of variants to antivariants are identically equal to zero. So that works really well for the early universe. Or if I'm doing relativistic Hagian collisions, like with the Large Hadron Collider. I know a lot of people here are doing. But that does not work at all for neutron stars. In neutron stars, you essentially only have baryons and you ignore completely the antivariants. We have tons and tons of baryons. And then you run into the fermion sign problem. And we cannot solve that right now. Um, so there's a lot of people working very hard on this, but you can get nowhere near neutron star burden. You can do small perturbations around this and try and you know, do a Taylor series to get out to large densities. But these densities are way, way smaller than anything reached in a neutron star. The other approach that people are trying, physicists are very clever, they're trying to look for quantum computing to see if they can create algorithms on um, quantum computers to actually solve this problem. But for the best estimates, we're probably like 40 years down the road from this. So it's very much an open issue. So how do we get at the physics then of how quarks and gluons interact? And if they're inside a neutron star, you turn to the equation of state. And so essentially, in order to understand something that's hundreds of millions of light years away from here, we need to understand more physics on the scale of the smallest building blocks of matter. And we put this into our equation of state. And this is how we can actually test things against astrophysical observations. So to give you an idea is we can measure the mass and the radius of neutron stars. And how does this then connect to the, the, the equation of state? Well, let's talk a little bit about this. We can at first imagine GR doesn't exist. Let's just look at Newtonian physics. It makes it a little bit simpler. But we can take a tiny fluid cell right here, and you have your pressure from the top and the bottom. And then you just solve, you can write down how your pressure changed with the radius. You have your gravitational constant. You have your density here, your mass, and it goes by 1 over r squared. You can then also solve just integrating over uh, 4 pi r squared and your density to get your total mass, right? This is what you have up here. And essentially, you have two coupled differential equations with your pressure and your mass. And so your equation of state here is, is essentially how your density here varies with your, your energy density up here. And so you have always some sort of, sorry, with your pressure up here. That's what I'm interested. 
So you can relate your pressure and your density, and this is then your equation state that you're putting in and solving properties to get the mass and radius of neutron stars. Now, of course, this is Newtonian physics. GR actually exists. Um, so because of uh, general relativity, we get these higher order corrections. So our pressure term, our, our dm, dr still is the same for the mass, but it still tells you the same story. It is basically you put in, in this case, we write in terms of pressure versus energy density. And so we just have this line that we can put in as our input. And we solve this to get then a mass and a radius. So how do we know we've solved it long enough? Well, basically, you start with a central density. You say, okay, this is my central density inside the neutron star. You just guess something. And you solve your equation until your pressure goes to zero. And that's when you're actually on the surface of the neutron star. So you just keep solving until the pressure goes to zero. And then you get a mass and a radius from this. Now, that might not be the right mass. Maybe it's too small or too big. You know, imagine you've measured a, a neutron star or two solar masses. And so you just keep iterating over different central densities until you get the right mass. And from there, then you can figure out your radius. So I'm going to show you what this looks like in one second. Before I do just some general units, I like to use natural units, but astrophysicists tend to use other units than me. Um, so just to give you an idea, I talk a lot about saturation density. That is essentially the density of the nucleus. We found from nuclear physics that, that all nuclei more or less have the same density. It's very consistent. So it's pretty astounding, actually. And if you were to translate that into grams per uh, centimeter cube, you get three times 10 to the 14. It's very, very dense, right? For energy, I always talk about MeV or meter cube. Ditto with pressure. I use the same units here. But in astrophysics, you talk about dimes per centimeter cube or grams per centimeter cube. So just so you have some sort of translation between the point to kind of take away from here, these are extremely large pressures, extremely large energy densities that we're dealing with. So how does this work with the equation state? Here's an example of many different equations of state that were calculated from various nuclear physics models. Most of them, not all, assume that you have a neutron star that's composed of neutrons, protons, and electrons. And it has other physics that I was talking about very low densities, like nuclei that are composed of the crust. You might have a pasta phase. You might have um, some n-body interactions with the protons and neutrons. But this is kind of the basic physics that they all have. And some of them at the interior might have more exotic physics. They might include hypons, so they have strange degrees of freedom, or they might include quarks. And I'll get into later a bit more how that affects things. But you can see here that then you get the spread. You have your pressure here. This is your density. This, to give you an idea, is saturation density here. And you have then these different equations. So what you would do is you'd systematically pick, oh, here's uh, initial center density. And then this gives me a point over here with my last radius. I pick a larger central density. This gives me a point here. A larger central density gives me a point here. And essentially, you then create a line over on the right-hand side. And what that means is that every single neutron star that you measure in the universe should fall on this line. Because the neutron stars are isolated generally, they're in equilibrium, um, before they, they actually collide. Once they collide, all bets are off. But we're talking about neutron stars that you're either measuring completely by themselves or before they actually touch each other. And so the idea is, that even if you know, you know, there's a mass of two solar masses or a mass of one, if you know exactly the equation of state, you should know and be able to just draw what the mass and radius relationship are, and every single neutron star measured in the universe should fall on that line. So to give you an idea of how what goes into the equation of state and how we can actually search for interesting particles, this is a nice example. So it takes one specific equation of state that has nucleons and leptons in it, you have a specific pressure and energy density. And generally, when you add new degrees of freedom into your equation of state, like imagine at some density, quarks switch on. Then you soften your equation of state. And so what ends up happening is for a, the same energy density, you have less pressure when you've opened up these new degrees of freedom. So when you've put in, uh, uh, sorry, not quarks, hydrons into your equation of state. 
Now, how does that then in turn affect your mass radius relationship? Well, think of it like this. If I have a specific central density and I have less pressure, I'm not going to push upwards as much. I'm not going to have a large radius. It's going to be a much more compact neutron star. And so you can see here, that's exactly what we find, is that if you look at the red line, for this mass radius sequence with hyperons, you have a much lower maximum mass. Whereas here, we call this a stiffer equation of state, you have a larger maximum mass. So what do you want to get out of neutron stars? Well, there's a lot of questions that people are, are studying. Um, what happens to these very tiny scales? Could they be coarse? Is there pasta? What type of phase transitions could we have? Could we have a critical point there, a first order phase transition line, a crossover? Um, or what sort of role does spin play? Could we connect this to future fires like an electron ion fire or something like this? There's a lot of really interesting questions going on. But the one that I want to probe here is what happens if we have very, very heavy neutron stars? So you might have heard about this mystery object in the news. There's GW190814. So this, this happened a couple years ago, is there was a collision between a very massive black hole and a really heavy mystery object. We don't know if it was a neutron star or a black hole. It was to around 2.5 to 2.67 slow masses. So just to give you an idea, there's this idea of a mass gap where we think there's a lower limit to the size of a black hole and how they can be formed. But then there's also an upper limit that most equations of states for neutron star can't exceed. And they have a really hard time producing those maximum masses. And this fell right in the middle of this mass gap. So the question is, what is this mystery object? So basically, almost immediately once this came out, there was tons of new papers on the archive, you know, the, the usual ambulance chasing. But there was a lot of ideas that, that came out of here that are quite interesting. You could imagine something that's spinning quite a bit, something super fast. Some people thought it was a primordial black hole, although in recent years, that seems like that's kind of being excluded as an idea. Um, you can think of exotic degrees of freedom, maybe hyperons are causing this. We don't know yet. Some people have been thinking if dark matter could have caused this. So the question is, how do we know if this could be a black hole or a neutron star? And if we observe something like this in the future, what should we look like, look for to see if what it is? So if you actually look at the LIGO paper itself that it came out, they generally thought that it shouldn't be a neutron star as this mystery object. They thought it was two black holes flying. So they presented a few different arguments for this. The main argument, and this is what I'm really going to be talking about here, is that there's a tension between the larger maximum mass and other constraints, such as measured radii and tidal deformability. So these are things that have been measured in the past. The next point they said is there's no visual component. However, this is not a hard thing to overcome. Uh, essentially, this is a very, very massive black hole, and it would have swallowed the, a neutron star immediately. So the fact that there's no visual component is, is actually anticipated. You also sometimes don't get visual components because of the direction that is pointing. Or if you have a hard time if it's far away to actually find it in the sky. So there's a lot of reasons where you could actually have a very standard two neutron stars colliding and not get a visual component. The other thing was from galactic population and modeling arguments. So this is something where you just measure the number of neutron stars that you can find in the universe, but this is also something where there can be biases, where you don't know, you can't see them. Maybe really heavy neutron stars come out of very specific universe, parts of the universe, or very specific emission emissions. We don't know much at all about this mystery object, so we can't really say, you know, if there's a bias there or not. The other thing too, and this is a really interesting point, is when you spin a neutron star, it can actually reach a higher maximum mass than normal. It's just because of the, the angular momentum is stabilizing it more. And then we're not able to measure what the spin of this object was. So it could be rapidly spinning and helping it to get to a larger maximum mass, but they couldn't measure it because it's very large level. So the part that I really want to talk about is this tension here. And really the question, is there a tension or not? Because the issue is, this depends strongly on what assumptions you're putting in about the equation of state. And so for that, you need to talk to the theorists. So the way they did their equation of state is, is they put in 
uh, Monte Carlo sampling methods over a very certain functional form of the equation state. So you're not putting in actual nuclear physics equations of state and testing them against the data. You, that, that would be way too computationally expensive. So what you do is you do a simple F5 form of what you think could be the equation state. And so you take these things, um, it's called a spectral equation of state, and you put in certain constraints. You put in what you know about existing radii, so there have been previous measurements of the radius of neutron stars at 1.4 solar masses. You put in that the speed of sound has to be causal, it can't be unstable, so you have certain constraints. And then essentially you use this expansion. And so the question is, how good does this actually reproduce equation of state from nuclear physics? What you end up finding is most of the equation of state with this approach ends up looking very, very smooth, right? So the question is, does, do nuclear physics equation of state look like this? So to talk, before I get into this, um, one of the things that we really use extensively to understand neutron stars is the speed of sound. It's an extremely important quantity. And this gives us different information about the equation of state that you wouldn't get otherwise. So to give you an idea, we all know the speed of sound more or less um, in air, you know, we can think about Mach clones, and if you pass the, the speed of sound boundary, it's around 343 uh, meters per second. However, in, uh, when you think about the speed of light, here it's much, much, much faster, right? You can see lightning going to the left. So the question that we want to ask, specifically neutron stars, is there's these, these clear objects, reach densities that we have no clue what's going on, what happens if the speed of sound and the speed of light are almost identical in size? And this, there seems to be indications that this could be happening in neutron stars. So to give you an example, these are equations of state from nuclear physics models of neutron stars, and you can see what the speed of sound looks like. Now I always use natural units. So up here is the speed of light, and here is zero. And this is your varying density in terms of saturation density. So what this means is right here at one is exactly the, the density of a nucleus. And so we want to see what happens here. Now I know it's a little chaotic because we tested many different models, but the thing that we found is that there's a lot of bumps and wiggles here. And you can get stuff that goes quite high up to basically the speed of light. In fact, what you can get, and which is a big no-no, is certain equations of state eventually becoming hot. Now, I wouldn't, you know, go and, and worry too much. There's a few caveats here. Is this equation of state only uses neutrons, protons, and electrons. Eventually, you expect to be able to large enough densities, you should open up new degrees of freedom. We should have neutrons and protons, electrons as degrees of freedom at like eight times the density of a nucleus. That doesn't really make sense. And so the point is, that you need to put other physics into your model in order to get the right equation state. And that should be causal at all times. And so what you can see here, those blue lines, for instance, are a nice example of this, is you have your equation state, this is neutrons, protons, and electrons, and at some point you get a peak here, and then it goes down. That's when you turn hyperons on in your model. So you're getting something more exotic. And so there's these little peaks of different hyperons, it might be lambda, the sigma, something else like this switch on, and then eventually, you get this dip here, which is when quarks happen. You've got a first order phase transition that goes into quarks. And so then you would have quark degrees of freedom here. So the point of nuclear physics gives you all this rich structure, little bumps and wiggles, and it could go to very, very large with the sound. So what I want to know is how can we actually distinguish something with these quark cores, where we have a large bump in the speed of sound, might go to the causal limit, versus something that just has nucleons in there, like neutrons, protons, and electrons. And the other issue is we don't want things to go off causal. That, that doesn't work out very well. So to do this is we have to have a collaboration, and it really takes a collaboration between not just nuclear physics, but people who are working on the gravity side as well. And so we have two experts on gravitational waves, and then we have one of, uh, actually, Brazilian expert, Veronica Dexheimer, who's not Kent State, um, with an extra, extra neutron star equation state. And these are a number of my students who have been involved in this collaboration as well, um, working on the neutron star equation state in various contexts. So what we do 
And we wanted to try something simple. Is instead of using these kind of smooth functions like the spectral equation, I say we want to explicitly put in structure in something like a functional form of the equation state that we can test many of them against the data. Because otherwise, it's just too computationally expensive to really test all these new curves in this equation state hand by hand. So, what we do is we take something for the low densities and then we put in structure and bumps. And then we make sure the really, really high densities that goes to one third. There is actually a limit from perturbative QCD that it should go to one third at large enough densities. So we have certain bounds. This, we can look at low energy nuclear physics. This is extremely high energy. And then we just put in a lot of structure to see what happens. And so the code is actually open source if you want to go and play with it yourself too. So the idea here is why is the speed of sound interesting? Well, I like to think of stuff in terms of phase transitions and signals of phase transitions. And one thing you would normally look at if you're thinking about phase transitions is susceptibilities. And so if you take the second derivative of the pressure respect to the chemical um, potential, you would get your susceptibility at zero temperatures. And you can relate this directly to your speed of sound. And so when we have a speed of sound, it's really at zero temperatures, the bare end density divided by the chemical potential by the susceptibility. And so we're getting these weird structures stuff that's going to very large values. It's an interplay because we're still increasing our bearing density, but then we have to have a chi two that's compensating that to get a large enough speed of sound. Other things to note about if you have a first order phase transition, you could have, you, you actually should have the plateau, the speed of sound going to zero. If you have second order phase transition, your chi two would diverge, and so you get a spike to zero. So a lot of people are thinking now of crossovers. And in crossovers, they're finding you can get this very large bump that goes to one to the causal, the, the, to the yeah, causal limit. So just to give you an idea, this is in a different context, but we can use like a 3D Ising model, and you can see then it's a little hard to see, but the speed of sound does definitely go to zero. You get some weird structure when you have a critical point. And this is something that we could also think about looking for too in the neutron stars equation state using this kind of formalism that we have. So then we want to see, like, okay, we've got this, this code, we can put together functional forms. Could we actually reproduce this data from astrophysics? So basically their point in the LIGO paper was, it's really hard to fit this constraint and still get up to 2.5 solar masses. But you can see here that if we use a low density equation of state and then allow for a very large bump in the speed of sound, that we can indeed easily get up and even above 2.5 solar masses. So this is something that, that could explain this data. Now, why is it that we would allow for this big bump? Well, like I said, if there's certain models out there that allow for crossover phase transition into quarks that would actually give you this very, very large bump in the speed of sound. So getting this, this information from nuclear physics is important. And of course, where do you put this bump? If you put it lower densities, you get a larger mass radius, if you put it at later densities, like deeper densities in the star, you still get a large maximum mass, but it doesn't quite reach, reach the data. So there's some interplay of where this bump can happen. In fact, it also depends on like how thick that bump is. Um, if you just play with your bump size and the location, eventually you could get a bunch of equations say that easily get up to 2.5 solar masses. And so this is not putting in anything funny into it. We're not rotating, it's just standard neutron star, and you can get up to 2.5 solar masses. So certainly from the aspect of the equation of state, it's entirely possible to get 2.5 solar masses. Doesn't break causality, anything like this to do that. In fact, what we did is we, you know, we got a little wild and we created a whole family of equation state that can get up to 2.5 solar masses. And you see it's very noisy. The problem is there's not enough constraints right now. Hopefully, with no, uh, future LIGO runs, there's nicer going on right now, we'll have much better data. But at this point in time, we just don't have a lot of constraints at large densities. So the only unifying feature amongst all these different equations of state is that they have a very, very sharp rise in the speed of sound. And it has to happen at low enough densities to get up to 2.5 solar masses. So this is a really unique feature. And this is something where the community really seems to be quite convinced that we have to get above this causal limit, or the conformal limit, and could even get quite close to the causal limit for the speed of sound. 
So to give you an idea, then we looked at the LIGO, LIGO posterior results for the equation of state and compared our family to equation of state and found that they were outside the bounds. And so really what this is, is it's a feature of the assumption the prior they were putting into the Bayesian model. If you put in a, a prior that's too restrictive, then you're, it's going to strongly affect your posterior probation analysis. So how could we understand that? Well, the issue is these equations of state that they have using the spectral function aren't very flexible. They're very smooth equations of state. And so they don't get these like sharp features that you would see in nuclear physics, like from pythons, from a crossover phase transition, something like this. And so what we did is we actually calculated the spectral fix. Um, and then we use this to see how it compares. So this, for instance, red line is the spectral fit that you get from their method. And this was the actual equation of state. This is the adiabatic index here. And you can see there's large deviations. Now, if you did a minimum price square fit, it actually wouldn't look that bad. The reason is, is that it generally gets low densities and high densities kind of okay, but it doesn't get these sharp features in between. And then if you want to see what that would look like on the mass radius, you can see that it actually changes it quite a bit. You don't get high enough maximum mass, and it pushes your radius sometimes out of bounds as well. So how do I actually measure this? I mean, right now, this is very theoretical work. We just show that it, in principle, could be a neutron star, but how can we prove it? You want some sort of smoking gun signal that this really heavy object that's a mystery could be a neutron star or not. So to do that, you need to look at the tidal beam probabilities. So like I told you, when these two neutron stars are rotating around each other, they're in there in spiral, they start getting deformed depending on how squishy they are. And so you can kind of see these examples here. The good news is this is strongly dependent on the equilibrium state. And this really is a smoking gun signal because if you have a black hole, it's identically equal to zero. You can't deform a black hole. Just like a bowling ball, you can't really squish it. It's, it's too dense. Whereas for neutron stars, you can always squish them. Even if they're very, very dense neutron stars, you can squish them and have a, tidal, a, a, a positive tidal deformability. So we did that as we took our equations the same that we created, and then we looked at what the tidal deformability would be if the neutron star was 2.5 solar masses. And you can see here we can then get a bound from our equation of state that that's around the order of 3 to 20. But the issue is what you can measure with modern LIGO today is really only on the order of 100 to 400. So the problem is, is that just the, the current sensitivity of the, the detector can only reach that low. That you can't get down to something, you know, you need like an order of magnitude or two order of magnitude better sensitivity. Now this will come, but for modern day time, it's gonna be a while before we could say one way or the other, something like this is a neutron star or a black hole. Because we have to have something very, very sensitive in order to say this is zero or not. So the other thing that we can do, and this is, this is something that I have hoped that we can measure much sooner, is actually the binary love relation. So this is, this is imagining the following. Um, you have, again, your spiral, your tidal deformabilities of each of the neutral stars. And the issue is, is that it's not that you, you know from the data what this tidal deformability is and what this one is, but you always have some relationship between the, the two of them. This is known as the binary love relation. And it's a degenerate relation that you have to break somehow. So the way you do this, the way you think about this, is you assign um, mass, the heavier neutron star is N2, the lighter neutron star is N1, and you take a ratio, this is called the mass ratio of Q, where it's always less than one, because you have the heavier neutron star on the bottom. And then you just define the symmetric love and asymmetric love. One of them, you add up the two tidal deformabilities, which is the average, and the other one is the difference between the two divided by two. And so this is what you would plot and what you, you have some sort of universal relation between them in order to break the degeneracy. So essentially what physicists do and what people are doing in LIGO is they take different mass ratios. So for GW170817, the very first neutron star merger, the mass ratio was, was nearly one. Um, and so this is pretty accurate for what you would expect. 
find that if you plot a ton of different nuclear physics equations, say you have this sort of universal relation, that's this black line here. And so within about 10% error, you can find a fit and break the degeneracy between the two tidal vulnerabilities. And so when you see the data from LIGO, they've always put this, you know, this sort of assumption that you've broken the degeneracy using some sort of universal relation. Now, the thing, again, to think about is what type of equation say were they using to study this? And one thing that goes in there is, did they actually have these large bumps in this speed of sound like we were talking about before? So we looked into this and we wanted to see if we have something like a large bump in the speed of sound, something that can create a very, very heavy neutron star, is this something that can actually show up in the data? And so what you do is you put this very large rise in the speed of sound at low enough densities. This black one you can see happens much later. And then we plot the mass radius, and they look very, very different. Essentially, you find that the high density bump leads to a mass radius curve that bends towards lighter radii, where this low bump goes to a mass radius that goes to high, very, very high masses and large radii. And so that's an effect from this big jump in the speed of sound at low densities. And again, something that helps you to get to really heavy neutron stars. Now, what's interesting is once we plotted the um, asymmetric versus symmetric tidal beam formabilities, this, this thing that you want, you're hoping to fit with a universal relation, it turns out that when you have a big bump in the speed of sound, you actually break the universal relation. And so this is the universal relation here, and this is what happens when you have these large bumps. And so this is something that, that is actually observable, is you, so you can measure this, in the near future, there's a few different ways is you can put in the equations of state and then see what the tidal deformability is. We actually derive a new sort of universal relation that you could use to extract this from the data. And you, or you could eventually, with, with future detectors, they will actually be able to measure the two tidal deformabilities separate. So they will have enough information to even, you know, fill in this line and measure it to see what the slope is. So this is something quite exciting. This would be a quite good indicator that something really, really exotic is going on in the neutron stars. So this just kind of gives you a timeline of what we would be able to do in the near future. Um, you know, we're going to have many, many upgrades in years to come, but eventually, especially if we get space-based telescopes, we'll be in really good shape to measure some features in years to come. Now, I think I'm nearly out of time, but I do want to say a couple more things in the last few minutes. Uh, we have this new collaboration called MUSIX. And so what it does is it brings together people in nuclear and gravity and particle physics and computer scientists to make a lot of these equations of state of neutron stars and also of heavy ion collisions, which can also explore a lot of this. And I know people here are working on this as well um, and make them open source and available to the public. So this is a huge effort. Um, in 16 different institutions, there's seven plus countries, there's people here locally in Brazil that are in part of this as well. And we really want to make sure that the whole community has access to different nuclear physics equations state, and they can look into these things themselves. And not just like, oh, here's a table, but they can actually go in, play with the parameters, and develop their own you know, new ideas with these equations of state. And so my students are working on this. Now, I see you guys have a couple of minutes, so I just want to say one last project that I think is really quite exciting with neutron stars is a dark matter component as well. Is because you're already bringing the you know, four, four the fundamental forces of nature, what else could be inside neutron stars? And so we know dark matter composes about 26% of our universe. And one of the candidates from dark matter that I think is really cool is called the Muir Twin Higgs model. So essentially, what that is, is you take your standard model and you scale up the masses three to six times heavier than the standard model. So what do you get out of this? You get something that's complex dark matter, it's self-interacting, has the same complexity as QCD, and it does seem to uh, help with certain hierarchy problems in physics as well from the standard model. But this is quite exciting and something that people have been looking into in recent years. Now, the really cool thing about mirror matter is this is stuff that I can just go calculate using nuclear physics by scaling up the masses. So to do that, I first developed 
uh, standard model equation of state. And so this is um, with one of the, the postdocs there, Mauricio Gibbert, uh, at the University of Illinois, as well as a couple of particle physicists and gravity experts too. And so first what we do is we take the cross, which we have to look at the nuclear landscape, essentially you do this like zigzagging through there until you get to the maximum um, nuclei that can be sustained. And then you also have to create some model. This is what Maurice worked on quite extensively, is you put in nucleons and protons, you put in different types of mesons and their couplings. This is just for the standard model equation states. And then you have to like match the two together. And so if you compare that to data, you can create it and it fits really well, but you need to do this first before you can play with the masses and you can start looking for mirror matter. So then what you can do, and this is the part that I think is really exciting, is Lattice QCD gives you all this information for free. It's in fact much easier from Lattice QCD to just calculate things like three to six times heavier for the pion mass. And then I can look at how that's going to affect my rho meson, the couplings, and everything like this. I get it for free. And so you just dig up a bunch of old lattice papers. This is, for instance, the rho meson and how it scales with the pion mass. And I can just extract that directly from Lattice. And so I take these points and I put that into my model. And so I use this to scale up all the, the nuclear physics equations of the state with different masses. And so you can see here's my equation of state. This is the standard model one. And essentially what you're doing is you're pushing it to higher and higher. This is the pressure, this is energy density, and this is different mirror matter values. So the typical value is about three to six times the higher mass. And so you just scale it up about three to six times and you're pushing it over to the right. So then the question is, what sort of observable signatures would you have from this? Well, the cool thing is, is it's very, very different than neutron stars. Is you get much smaller masses and much smaller radio. You can see this kind of yellow envelope to show that it's completely different than anything you would measure with neutron stars. And so you might wonder, well, don't we already exclude? We know these data here, right? But this is something else. This would be, imagine your dark matter, part of it is this mirror twin model. It could be stored in these mirror neutron stars. So whatever you're actually visually observing is completely disconnected. And so you have to measure this in a new way. These would be completely dark objects. So, so we couldn't visually see them. We have to use gravity essentially to measure them. So how do we do that? Well, that's the good news about gravitational waves is because of this spiral and these high deformabilities, no matter if it's dark, we can't visually see it, we can still measure the squishiness of the star in the in spiral. And so what ends up happening is you can then plot the tidal deformability versus mass. And again, this is our standard model one. And you see that it fills up an entirely different phase space. The tidal deformabilities are much smaller for the same mass. And so if you measure something out in this region, and it, it, it first of all has to have a tidal neutron really that's not zero, right? Because we don't want it to be a black hole. Then you really have to have a neutron star, or a mirror neutron star, sorry. Because it can't be the standard model. It would be consistent with the, the Milman circles. So anyway, that brings me to my summary. I hope I convinced you that there's a lot of really exciting physics going on with compact objects, um, and specifically using gravitational waves to study them. To me, I find this, this large maximum mass extremely fascinating. I think it gives us sort of opportunity to think about what sort of role quarks could play in the center of neutron stars. Also, the tidal deformability is really the key to answering what this mystery object is, if we can measure something that's not zero. And there's also these future opportunities to measure potentially dark matter as well from gravitational waves. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice call. Questions, comments? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, a little question. Can you uh, see also the neutrinos produced for the other star? For what? Neutrinos. Ah, oh, for neutrinos. Um, yeah, so the way people, well, okay, there's a lot of different things that people are thinking about with neutrinos. Um, you could think about how neutrinos affect the temperature of neutron stars, so different interactions. Um, this would be something more relevant for the merger itself, but this would be uh, something where you have to actually put in 
all the complex neutrino interactions to get the right temperature of the neutron star. So that might actually show up uh, once we get to the point where you can measure the gravitational waves of the merger itself. The other thing there are people doing, like, like George back there, is studying how the interactions with neutrinos could make your system out of equilibrium. Now, we've done some back of the envelope estimates. It doesn't look like anything I'm talking about here is going to be affected by that. It's just because the temperatures are so very, very low. And it, it's just not moving enough to really get cause it to be out of equilibrium or to be relevant. Um, but once you again, once you have the merger, it looks like then it can play a much stronger role. Explain again what's the reason for uh, going to the added masses mm -hmm. that you talked about again. Yeah, so um, if I go back a little bit here, I kind of glossed over because I knew I didn't have that much time to talk about it. But um, essentially, a lot of people are looking for very light dark matter, and we haven't found any signals yet. And so, one way that, that particle physicists are going into is looking at um, heavier dark matter, but is some sort of complexity to it. And so this solves a couple of issues with a hierarchy problem um, in particle physics, and this is sort of the motivation for this. It also um, is something nice because it's not something where you're expecting interactions directly with the standard model. So you wouldn't be looking for, uh, some people look at this, um, you know, maybe like condensed matter or things or um, full atom or something like this, where you expect some sort of very, very weak interaction. And this, there's probably no interactions except for the Higgs. So if you wouldn't expect it to show up in the particle physics models or, you know, the LHC. So it does explain why we're not seeing it there. Um, and so when you have this complexity, then they find that, and I don't know all the details because I'm not a particle physicist, but somehow this three to six times the pi mass is a sweet spot for it. Um, and so that's what I've been studying there. My question? About the mm -hmm. equation of state, mm -hmm. do you think that uh, really the constraints in this in this part is going to come from from cosmological constraints, or mm -hmm. do you think that you are going to have some uh, breakthrough through the latency or? Mm -hmm. Or not? What are you feeling? Because it's it's a kind of mess, no? right? Right. It's it's very very hard. Um, and so I think for the question that it basically it depends on what density you're talking about. I think if you go to like the cross and low densities, this has to come from from nuclear physics experiments on Earth. So the very low densities um, effort is really probing. When I was talking about these like heavier and heavier nuclei, you you can't do anything without that. Because you need to get really the, the nuclei that are along the, the neutrons are flying um, that have are very neutron rich. And so we don't even have like all of them measured or know exactly we have models, but they need to actually measure what those masses are. So this really comes from new experiments. Um, if you then go to, to somewhat larger densities, it still depends on the experiments because you need to have n body interactions. So there was actually this new result from Elise that was quite exciting that came out on hydron baryon interactions. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that the people have now been trying to use in the neutron star equation of state to understand how hydrons play a role. Um, and so I think up to a certain point in the equation of state, maybe up to like two times saturation density, that really requires nuclear physics and nuclear physics input from like experiments and here. Um, now the higher densities, at some point we don't have anything that really gets up there. And so then I'm hoping, you know, the mass to mass will make a huge difference in terms of understanding what's going on. If we knew for sure, we know at least it's two times solar mass, because you can measure this from ICER, but if it goes up to 2.5 versus two, that will make a very big difference. And then the next thing, but it's much harder to get is what the actual radius is of those heavy neutron stars. Um, so sometimes it's a lot easier to get see the mass, but the radius is very difficult. Um, from LIGO, it's very difficult because you need to be able to measure this type of probability that's very close to zero. So we don't have a sensitivity. NICER is, is working on this now, but they're only looking at two solar mass uh, neutron stars. And so they, they are there to give some initial data. I think I had some of my thoughts, but um, they're, they have three more years that were due 
And so they're going to observe these pulsars much longer. So that's just going to bring in those error bars, which will make a really big difference in the state. So I think 